Solar Storms by Linda Hogan, Chapter 8. In the north, people measured their lives by the winters and kept account of what happened in each one. As was what I called the house of now. Some winters were remembered by what wasn't there. There was the winter of no wolves, the winter of no parchments, the winter of no children. There were winters, too, of terrible presence. The appearance of influenza, the winter of frozen rain that covered snow in a hard shell of ice, so that it broke the legs of deer and moose and left the snow red with their bleeding. This was the winter Frenchie's horse fell and froze into the ice while it was still alive, melting the ice with its warmth as it sank deeper. It was the time of shadows, they said. A woman was found inside a block of clear ice that year, and a certain current of air met near the water and turned him into ice. And I belonged to that winter. I was born one February inside of snow, so deep it collapsed the roofs of houses. I crossed infinity to come to life through an angry, screaming woman, as if I arrived from the place where storms were created, a world where bad medicine was made from bodies of women and men, the milk of deer, the loss of land. I arrived in the place where traders had passed with sleds of dead, frozen animals. According to Bush, I was born in a house of snow. It was a winter when snow fell so thick in the trees, it crowded out what light was left, and the white man, in such darkness, believed it was total eclipse. Roofs collapsed under winter's weight, trees swayed and groaned. They complained of so much heaviness that even their voices were weighed down. And all the houses, too, were covered with mounds of snow that shifted in the wind. And the midwife said she heard you crying when you were still inside your mother. When you left forever, the waters of your mother that night, that early morning, cold went so deep the trees outside, your birthing place shattered from inside themselves and flew apart. The explosion of heartwood sounded like gunshots. Bark flew in all directions across the snow, hitting a window, hitting a wall. Remembering history, the people dropped and hid themselves on a cold floor, except your mother, who was not threatened by anything as simple as gunfire. The midwife was Ruby Shawl, a small, square woman with a red headscarf, perfect hands, and a peaceful face. She presided over the passages of people into both life and death. And she was miserable when those were the same person. She hated to be at both ends of the same life. She went to the one room house your mother shared with the trapper, a man who took in troubled young girls on the pretext of helping them. Hannah was one of his girls, but he was not there the day you were born. He had gone out to check his snares and follow his trap line to the north. For trappers, February was a busy time. Furs were at their thickest. When she cut the birth cord that connected you to your mother, Miss Shaw didn't say what she said to the other mothers at every birth. She didn't help Hannah say goodbye to your baby. She watched Hannah closely, as if she knew that the goodbye would be permanent. She told me later, as if she knew why. The sky was clear for a few moments that first night, and Miss Shaw could see by the light of snow how heavy the snow was. The trees bent under the weight of it. Looking up, she told me. She saw the roof begin to bulge inward, but she was afraid to go out and clean it off. She did not want to leave you alone with Hannah. She feared you were in danger. She felt what was to come. She avoided sleep the first days of your life, listening to the trees creak with the weight of the snow, guarding you, fearing to let dreams take her away from the dark, cold room, and the fiercely awake woman who gave birth to you. She melted buckets of snow, but each bucket yielded only a small amount of water. Ruby Shaw had children at home and a husband, but she stayed on with Hannah, hoping the bitter weather would let up. She was sure help would come, but no one appeared. She could see the snow-covered road, but no one would walk on it. You were a good child and didn't fuss, she said. The firewood was mostly gone, and there were only a few staples of rice and dried milk. Hannah's breasts were dry. Like her mind and heart, her body had nothing to offer. It had already abandoned you. The snow was tireless and without end. One day the roof sagged so much that it seemed sure to collapse. Mice scratched about in the corners and inside walls. After waiting for Hannah to sleep, Miss Shaw finally, in the terrible freeze, had no choice. She pulled on her boots, bundled herself in her coat and red scarf, salted the ice-covered steps, and went silently outside to shovel snow off the roof. I can see in her mind's eyes, her round belly, her breath stopped before her face, the red clothing she always wore. The snow was so deep that she climbed it and stepped onto the roof with ease. She worked quickly. In such cold, there is always too little time. As she returned, winded, she heard Hannah fumble at the lock. When she tried the door, it was latched from the inside. Let me in, she called. She rattled the door, hit it. Steam from her breath froze, surrounding her in something like a halo. She went around the house and tapped the little windows. Hannah, open the door. 
The windows were frozen over, with breathing and steam from within. She could see nothing through them, and she was wasting precious time in terrible, ungodly cold. And so she had no choice but to find her way through the bitter wind to where I lived at Old Fish Hook, as it was called then. Hannah, she thought, would listen to me. It wasn't quite a mile walk, but she had no snowshoes, and now and then she fell through the snow up to her waist. There were trails, the wind had made them, where a shining crust had formed on the snow, and she tried to walk on these trails. Tree limbs had broken along the way, and Ruby Shaw moved several of the fallen branches from what she thought was the path. By then, a cutting storm of sleet slanted down, the kind you could hear as it hit the snow. Under different conditions, the sleet might have been a good sign because it meant the skies were warming. But in fact, it was only made the journey more treacherous. She hurried along. There was the light of winter. It sheened across the white and frozen world. It was a beautiful, it always is, but there was no comfort in it. It was a beauty, like Hannah's, dangerous, and it made the whole weight of winter fall at the back of Ruby Shoal. I'd been at work, chipping ice from the inside of the door. I held the dark blue umbrella up against the sleep. I chipped ice with only one hand. In such cold, the sound were sharp and brittle, hollow winter sounds. At first, I didn't see Miss Shoal. When I looked up, I saw that Ruby's scarf had frozen to her hair. She was staggering, exhausted. Her face was burning, her lips looked pale. I went to her at once. I slipped my hand inside the older woman's bent arm, took her through the door, and sat her down in front of the stove. That kind of ice and cold steals a woman's mind and voice. So Miss Shaw said nothing as I heated coffee and wrapped a warm blanket around her. The umbrella sat on the floor beside her, frozen open. Outside, a chill wind roared through the trees. It rattled frozen limbs. As soon as the midwife sipped the coffee and took her voice back from the cold, she said, you need to come with me, and we should hurry. She stood up, ready to go. I slipped on my rubber boots. I put on my black coat. I was afraid for you. Along the way, a tree branch broke and crashed in front of us. Neither of us spoke. We ran around the fallen branch and hurried along, half running. Both of us certain you would be hurt. I fell in a strip of glare ice along the way and bruised my thigh. The snow began to fall again. We wasted no time. When we arrived at the trapper's house, the door was still locked. It's Bush, I said. I hit the door with my fist. It's Bush, let me in. At once the door opened, but there was no sound of footsteps along the wooden, settled floor. Hannah was not the one who opened it, even though no others were there to be seen. Inside there was little warmth. There was only a thin, spare fire in the stove, and the firewood was gone. Hannah sat in the rocking chair across the room, her back to the door. She's not my baby, she said. My baby died at birth. You were nowhere in sight. The firewood was gone. I pretended to sip from a cup of cold coffee. The room was so chilled, our breaths were like ghosts speaking themselves into existence right in front of our faces. Rocking in the chair, Hannah looked like a child. The midwife looked at me. Knowing Hannah, I was careful to sound calm. By then, I had learned how to speak with her. Where's the baby? I asked, surprised at how calm I sounded. I was quiet and slow, trying not to upset her, but all the while I looked for you, in the trash can, the closet, beneath the bed still spotted with birth blood. It's in none of those places. Hannah listened to me move across the room. She was smart. She could hear like an animal, stronger and better than other people, more like a lynx or fox. The midwife was crying. It's my fault, she cried. I knew better than to leave her. It crossed my mind, she said later, that a child born to such a woman might have been better off dying. Keep it away from me. It's not mine, said Hannah, meaning you, the baby. She held a lock of red hair. The rest of it was beside the bed, a pile of fire cut through by scissors. An empty black kettle sat on the stove, smoking over a dwindling flame. I took it off the fire and looked inside. I was afraid that I would find you there, but you were not in the kettle. You weren't in the oven either, and you weren't smothered beneath the pillow. I went outside, glancing back at the windows that were frozen over with all the breathing. There were no tracks outside. Nothing human could survive in such cold. I was certain, began walking in circles, an ever widening spiral across snow and ice, and there were no tracks to follow, and you didn't cry out. You didn't even kick or wave your arms. Maybe you were resigned to your fate, to a birth delivered to ice. I found you tucked into the branches of a birch tree. You were still and blue, and a thin layer of snow had fallen over your head and naked stomach. The kind Indians call pollen snow, because it meant more was coming. That winter would continue. You were alert, alive, but silent and cold as ice. I put you beneath my shirt, next to the warmth of my body, and you searched for a breast. You searched out warmth. You wanted to live. You were tiny, you were cold, and you wanted to live.